Okay, this guy over here to the left is known as Aaron Ra. I invite you to go look at his stuff. He's kind of like uh, someone who refutes Bible apologetics and uh, is an expert in um, archaeology and the phylogenetic tree and all kinds of stuff. Uh, a well-versed guy here. Looks like a biker. Has the knowledge of a professor, let's just say. But what we're looking at is a statement that was in just one of his videos. And maybe you've heard this before in this video he's talking about is Bible myths and stuff and like creation and where that comes from and how that if whether or not that even has a possibility of being true versus what we know. And here he's dissecting a moment where you may have heard the idea that 1% of a difference between people and chimpanzees. You ever heard this? Well, this is not true, but they want you to, they really want to drive home that idea that um, we're evolution, a product of that, not necessarily that idea that came out in the Bible where God just like magic makes something, you know, and turns around and makes a woman from a rib and cheats from a magic tree because a talking snake told her to. That reality is a little different than that. And that, you know, they, they knew at that time that there were other people. You always wonder where um, Cain went to in the land of Nod and how he could possibly take a wife. Well, they knew other people were around. This was really a story of like these Caucasian people who had become the sons of gods and all these things going on that weren't really evident in other people. And then, of course, there were still primitive people at that time on the earth. And we'll get into that kind of in an example of that um, here shortly. But that idea that 1% a difference between just a chimpanzee or bonobo type and us is not really true. I mean, there's a radical difference. Hopefully people understand that there's not just, uh, with the whole DNA and the whole sequence and everything that goes on, there's not just a 1% difference. But you've also heard that we're 92% the same as a banana. And there's a reality that that too is just, the genome sequence is only made up of a few letters, which are, uh, connected to uh, proteins and just their first letters pretty much. And so they have different combinations. And there are combinations in a banana and they use the same kind of thing. It's looked like that at 92%. It's not like, you, you see, because there's a radical enough difference between somebody, just two human people that they can do a Mori Povich and tell you you're not the father. And believe me, that's not less than 1% of anything that's being looked at in your DNA either, and everybody you know, knows and understands that. So this is a myth and a fallacy of that concept. But these are just protein coding DNA regions of the two genomes and only includes the heritable single nucleotide differences. It ignores the changes on the larger level loss of whole genes that there are differences of between us and monkeys rearrangement of gene orders, loss or gain of regions of chromosomes. You might have heard the idea that we have a chromosome that's stunted and doesn't have its tetramere thing correctly. And it's almost like if you find that in other creatures, they're almost like a downsy kind of thing. But in us, it's made us this sentient, incredible thing, almost like an autism thing. But overall in reverse and in outward order. Anyhow, if you include those additional changes, the difference between chimps and human genomes climbs to 4%. And researchers think these large-scale changes may have played a bigger role in our evolution from a common ancestor with chimpanzees. It says concordance. Now that's a concordance of what we believe right now and the way things work out scientifically. And so, no, we don't come from chimpanzees. Chimpanzees come from us. 
you could say something like that, like all apes come from us because we're the common ancestor, because we're talking about us. So we're the common ancestor, just like they're one. And so in that fact, you get the idea that we may be the common ancestor, or they may be the common ancestor of us, and just look at it in an open way. You know, what I find a terrible thing is, is that we can study science about anything or any topic whatsoever from the distant stars and galaxies all the way down to all the different phylum and ge genetics and flora and fauna of the earth and even microscopic things and even stuff that's down to the atomic level and all seem to be in a consensus and an idea that we should go to the nth degree figuring out all this stuff. But wouldn't it be strange and terrible if there was one aspect of this science that we're well, well versed in and we now have all this incredible uh, equipment and computers made to figure it all out and everything and get it down and DNA genetics and stuff and be able to apply that towards any creature on the planet even plants and things radiocarbon dating and all that stuff but take this genetics thing and we use it for common good and figuring out everything and how everything works and all of that but yet take ourselves and put us over on a shelf and not try to look at it. Whenever we'll be able to easily figure it out because we are we and if you had any interest in figuring out what really happened you would be deep into it. Secret be known people have already done this in many aspects from just basic archaeology, craniometry, things like that, figuring it out. Years ago, scientists got together and they decided to look at, well, let's just look at where all the fossils are and, uh, you know, kind of take a relook at this out of Africa idea and from then to now and in a timeline in these different skulls and they couldn't get every skull but they've made perfect copies of every single one of them so people can themselves have their hands on it and take a good look at it and in doing something doing so they found something that was pretty strange and outstanding they found that below the sub-saharan level there was only archaic hominids found and they were found until a modern time, till even after the last ice age. So instantly, they were like, well, somebody's not speaking up about these things. They're just keeping a silence, an eerie silence about human evolution and how it all came about. And honestly, I believe it has more to do with this Aaron Ron apologetics because it has to do with having uh, us having this biblical idea of the way things happen drove into us so much that we really have a hard time doing any archaeology that actually disproves it then there are people that have just stepped over that and go look here's a dinosaur bone and here's what it dates to and there becomes a million apologetics for how that could actually work out and somehow they were alive right before the flood running around but then swirly poo and they're all gone except for the ones that were on this little boat and they somehow made, you know, polar bears. Uh, let's not go into that. But we've been trapped with that idea that people can't even open up about it. And it's like you, because it's us, you can't look at it in a third person and try to figure it out. And the strange thing about that to me is that whenever I do all of this history that I do and looking through all of that, I instantly am stepping out in a third person's point of view. Ever since a little kid, I was able to do that because I wanted to have a correct reasoning about it and not something that was somewhat selfish. Whenever I did and I was able to look at what goes on and I was still a kid and didn't know much of everything, I'm talking six, seven, eight years old, I kind of got it figured out and then knew that I would find out all these things that would show it that it was totally different than that. And amazingly, somehow, I was uh, up in the 90-something percentage, percentage of right and would actually get an A on the test, probably, if they would have done it. 
as to what we have now. Not that we're all the epitome of everything, which we always think we are, and we're going to figure out more and more things, but why hamper ourselves on ourselves? It would seem like the most foolish thing that we could do was to hamper ourselves in learning the truth about ourselves. Does that make any sense to anybody? Doesn't make much sense to me. Also, statements like this doesn't make much sense. Right when they were first said, then I heard it, we're only 1% different than a chimpanzee, and it's like, you mean we could just change? There's this big old long chain, and it's got a swirl on it, and it's hooked up with thionine, guanine, all these uh, different ones, which are really, you know, like six different things, and, and they connect to each other and stuff. And if we just took a chunk out and a little bit here and this one and that one, and changed it out that all of a sudden we would be a chimpanzee. That kind of makes you think that that's what it is, but it it's not. Just like in the first upper statement here, it talks about these additions, these chromosomal differences and all this type of difference. But here's a big shocker for this idea that's going on here. And we'll visit this in truth so I can show you what I'm talking about and the difference of what goes on. You see, we have to step past this biblical idea that, well, you know, something magical did happen about the time that they claimed that it did in the flood in our archaeological record. But we all, you know, everybody making cities and doing things. But now we have found that that was going on a long time before and before that. It's just when you connect it to Sumer, that's whenever it starts to happen there. And because that's where the biblical idea concept comes from and the where the people in captivity got that idea from that we have taken the idea of that was it because it, it says it was the first cities and all these things. Well, here's a city over here and, uh, you know, here's Catalhoyuk over here. Whoops. Here, oh, uh, here's uh, Gobekli Tepe and it's like Stonehenge and it's like 50 of them all built together and stuff and it dates to right at the end of the last ice age and then they buried it up strangely oh wait here's another one here's an oh you know what they got a concrete floor out here that they've made yeah they made concrete here's stone bowls they're not even used pottery yet they're using stone bowls it's like wickedly like fred flintstone how advanced were they yeah it's like fred flintstone you see he's not ugh it's a lot going on makes it a lot different, but uh, I kind of had that idea a long time ago that these people couldn't have been UG. You know, uh, my brother and I had these uh, dioramas that had dinosaurs all over it, and of course they took ones from different ages and put them all together, and in this they showed some Neanderthals and they showed some Cro-Magnon people, and if you set it up right, it almost looked like they were fixing to get into a fight with each other across with all these other animals near it, and, La and La Brea Tar Pit, and saber two tigers, and then you can get a T-Rex, too, and those, of course, never saw each other. But anyhow, seeing that in some of the movies and everything, and I got a different idea towards what's going on, but, of course, studying it science-wise, you get more of a an idea of what's going on. And up until a very, very modern time, we've been able to actually tell the truth about things like this and what we found, and then we started to find more and deeper and differences and that became a problem. Now, in the science world, they are tickled to death to find out the difference between this wolf that lives over here and this one that lives over here. Lineages of dogs and where it comes from and everything else, but they sudden silence, an eerie silence, whenever we talk about ourselves, and all of a sudden it's racist. No, it starts with an R. It's called reality. And if you start to claim that reality is racist, then we really have a serious problem. Or we don't have a problem. It's reality and need to get on with it. It's as simple as that. This same statement could be used as I just have used here and plug in different words in there that people over time in science found something totally new like gravity and other things and they go we need to da 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 
and put it in and then get on with it. This is reason we are here where we're at. But we can't do it as opposed to ourselves so for some reason. We can't step outside. Seemingly every time we do any of this science, a lot of it's done mentally and stuff. And then, you know, looking through microscopes, things like that. And then you're really in a third person perspective in that aspect, finding out things. And in reality, in your mind, you're in a third person's perspective, point of view, out of body almost experience, going through these ideas. Think of Stephen Hawking as he's going through these ideas. It's all in his mind. Third person aspects. And you find out things about science. I think the terrible thing, again, that I guess I'm getting to is that we just can't seem to study ourselves to the point of finding out the truth. And that seems to be hampered primarily because of religion and the dogma that's been created out of having a religion pounded into you for so long that we're trying to come out of dark ages, all those things that happen, that people are shy about this. And then, of course, in the modern day, anything that you say about these people being different from those people is racist. And that's gotten past pathetic. It's lost all of its power, and now we're back at full circle of stupid, and we still need to get on with the idea of figuring out, well, where did we all really come from? What are the differences that we can visibly see? Everyone is smart enough to realize it. Where does that come from? Well, let's take a look at some answers to this ideas of where certain people came from. You see, there's a problem, too, with evolution and all those things and where we we're taught in almost a fairy tale way of how there was these real archaic monkey people like Lucy, and then there was these people that kind of look human, but you'd freak out on them. You'd be like, nah. And then there was these people that didn't quite look right, but they were kind of human. And so we're kind of like Homo erectus types. And then there started being different forms of that. And all those other ones died off before. Each one was like a dying off, and here's another, and dying off, and here's another. And here's a new form, here's a new form. Some of them came out of Africa. Some of them never did. And whenever they did, they just magically, due to seeing a little bit less sunlight, turned into totally different people and ran into Neanderthal that nobody wants to explain how it evolved and was out and nobody in Africa has it. So how did that possibly happen? But... This magic that's supposed to happen isn't even it. They find that the people that were in North Africa that left Africa were already a modern human that you would recognize, and it wouldn't be like, there's something wrong with that dude in the modern day. You'd be like, yeah, that's a modern human. As opposed to a real reality concept that there were people still left in Africa and places around the world that were much more archaic at this time, and they have archaeology to that. So it says... If you want to give it an out of Africa, it happened way, way before. Because how did Neanderthal get there? How did this get there? And the variations that are there. It's not like there was a group sitting there right at the Nile waiting to get out. And all of a sudden, one day, everybody decided, well, certain groups are going to leave out. And I'm going to go this way, and I'm going to go that way. I mean, you know, it starts to get to be a fairy tale. It's not the way that it worked out. But also that strange effect where there was modern humans, 315,000 B.C., Homo sapiens. And now people have arguments on whether it was about 195 or 165,000 years that there was a totally modern human that you wouldn't recognize being any different than it was today. And we talked about Cro-Magnons and how it used to be something that you'd think of of Cro-Magnon versus Neanderthal and da-da-da. Well, yeah, that's true. But at that same point, they've checked the DNA out of a Cro-Magnon in Puglisi Cave, and it comes out to people that are still here today. So where did this magic change actually happen? Well, it actually didn't. And while this was in effect at 30,000 years ago at least, that's as far as we can get the DNA back at this point, 
there's a concept of there are still existing hominids from steps, steps back. If you want to believe that we all stemmed off of one tree, effectively not some seven point something million years ago that doesn't even really look ape-like yet before the apes all formed and we formed and we were one of those things that came out of that group which is the concept instead of being we're like we came from a chimpanzee but that's where the phylogenetic tree and the connections of people like sub-saharan africans and the rest of the world connect to not that it connects to a real modern time like what you're led to believe and there's only subtle difference because of sunlight and maybe somebody did something different one day those radical differences end up making to where one of them was the spaceman heralds of mankind that pretty much created everything in front of you and the other one was a still existing hominid and you can't simply say it's the lack of interaction in telling them something because there's a hybridization that happened that took them out of the form that was still some homo erectus type that was still extant on the planet today did a series last year where I showed that this happened actually in Australia. It happened in what we call the Orient now today. And it's happening in Sub-Saharan Africa at this point. We can still see people that are a primitive form like in Australia. Like in Erie and Jaya and the headhunters that still live there as primitives. Still in Sub-Saharan Africa and the different people that really aren't totally related to each other like the Khoisan or the Pygmies or the Bantu type people which we'll talk about here in a second being radically different than any other people. There is something in the Bantu people that make up to almost 20% of their genetics which no one else on the planet has. When they talked about it, it, it keeps getting more and more fervent whenever they talk about the idea that genetics in Africa are the most diverse. Why? Because they have pygmy population there in the first place. If they just had that versus everything else, that would be like, well, that's more diverse. But the fact that the Khoisan aren't related to the Bantu, which aren't related to the pygmy, are the Khoisan, are the Nilotics, and so on, and the variations that are going on there, along with all the primordial Caucasians that were there all around the Mediterranean for at least 30,000 years. There's Cro-Magnon forms being found there, but hold up. There's no modern form of Sub-Saharan Africans or the Negroid type people that you would think of until a very modern time in correlation or in opposed to what's going on. In fact, in North Africa, at a place called Jebel Erud, 315,000 years ago, has been found Homo sapiens, as I said earlier. But in that fact, this Homo sapiens is not quite exactly what we see today. And again, the argument is around, well, was it around 130, 40,000 years ago? Or was it around 180,000 years ago that you couldn't have told the difference between a modern man and now? And in fact, genetics totally says that Cro-Magnon here is here today. Well, if you want to give it a breaker in there, then there's the Neanderthal interaction that makes a different person come out of that that's just slightly different. And at that point, that would be a different person, of course. And so you have to go after that point. So you might be able to draw it back 50s. People are saying 60,000 years now and formed what? was pre-proto-cro-magnon that formed what is modern today so you would say that's it and could you tell the difference and as they get better and better at facial recreations and stuff and learning about what the tools they found and certain scrape marks and everything on it they found Neanderthal was much more advanced than we ever gave credit for and wasn't even Ugg himself but Cro-Magnon was quite advanced. In fact, by that point, a clear statement was made long time ago and still stands, no matter how much archaeology we have done and probably will in the future, that these primordial Caucasoid people that turned into Cro-Magnons, which are our modern Caucasian type people that we have here, mixed in with some genetics and other things that go on, were the most advanced people on the planet at the moment that they 
stepped on the planet or showed up. And it's been that way ever since. And there wasn't anybody advanced more than apparently what they derived out of, which was the first proto Homo sapiens, giving the idea that the holotype for all of this was that, because again, in Sub-Saharan Africa, they were still a hominid species, steps back in what we call evolution, which we were led to believe when we were younger that they had all died off by then, but then somehow like the land of the lost or having an island that had dinosaurs on it like we always thought was going on, deep in Africa. It didn't get certain creatures wiped out whenever big things happened because it didn't hit in Africa. Whenever the Younger Dryas effect happened and stuff, it killed off all the big creatures except for in Africa. And there still were some lingering on and lions and things and lions and tigers and bears, oh my, all up and through Europe and through the Americas and so on. But those quickly were gone. And it was caused by a Younger Dryas event, not a bunch of freaked out cavemen like they tried to give the idea that we could chase them down to the nth degree or somehow the, the the ecology just fell apart and it like a set of dominoes or cards just fell apart whenever this person's tray prey went out more likely we ate all the rabbits and then there was nothing for the saber-toothed tiger seed and that caused an ecological flop that caused this to happen and this to happen and this to happen than it ever would be that we just ran through and mowed it up like they want to put some guilt trip on Caucasians every time they talk about something happening in America. Well, hey, those people were people here before, and in their stories they tell you there were people here before, and they weren't, they weren't of course, a, a congenial unit. They were something quite different. But let's look at what is said about Sub-Saharan Africans and this idea of them being here until a very modern time as still an extant hominid species and how that could happen. Listen closely. This is probably going to be a little more faint even than my normal recording because it's done ambiently. This is Chris Stringer, an expert scientist in the field, showing you this effect that many people realized whenever they started going back through and seeing what we had available to show us a timeline and when things happened and dating. This is a, a replica of a skull from Nigeria and it was dug up in 1965 by Thurston Shaw and his team, an archaeologist. It is about 13,000 years old and my colleague Katerina Avati uh, used a new technique of digitizing the surface of the skull in 1972 and she found as I did that it does not look like recent African material. So here we've got a recent African skull and here's the skull from Iwo Eleru in Nigeria. You can see that this skull is much longer, it's much lower and uh, all in all, it's got a much more what we could call primitive appearance, even though it's only 13,000 years old. And in Katerina's analyses, she found that the nearest neighbour, in terms of the overall shape of the skull, was this specimen from Tanzania, from a site called Ngoroba, which is, we think, about 140,000 years old. So you've got a specimen that's only 13,000 years old, but it looks like it should be, you know, another 100,000 years older in terms of its shape. So what's going on? So this suggests that human evolution in Africa was more complex, that the transition to modern humans was not a straight kind of transition and then a cutoff. The archaic humans did not necessarily die away once they'd given rise to modern humans. They may have been living in some parts of Africa alongside, in a sense, their descendants, and perhaps exchanging genes with them, just as Neanderthals seem to have interbred with people outside of Africa, Archaic humans in Africa could have been interbreeding with modern humans inside of Africa, and this skull may show a reflection of that interbreeding between archaic and modern humans. This is the wiki article on Asilar Man. He is the earliest... See if I can highlight this for you. Asilar is the earliest known anatomically modern skeleton of the Negroid type. This happened recently. 
because he is only from 6,400 years before present or 4,400 B.C. He is the first form that looks like a modern form and he's a hybrid actually of already modern humans that were extant in the other part of the world, already people that had gone out of Africa and then come back into it and hybrided to them at that point, which gives us what we call a modern Negroid form from something that was still an extant hominid species as just shown by Chris Stringer. What he showed was Iru It's also mentioned here, Iru which is 11,000 years before present, or actually now they figured out it's about 9100 BC, so they're going to give it another 100 years on it. But this is the oldest form of a Negroid type, or one that have a Negroid phenotype of anybody in the world that they've ever found. I know you've seen archaic species that look somewhat like them because there were creatures that are somewhat related to earlier forms that become later evolved forms of what you would still call a Homo erectus form. You know, Turkana boy, all these different ones that they have found here. In fact, these are ones of those. And it is showing you here that they weren't died off at over 200,000 years ago or over 315,000 years ago and boop sprouts out this boop sprouts out and we're all the same until a point and then have a spreading out but well below this point in fact because of this and a knowledge that they find that sub-saharans have up to 19 percent of an unknown hominid because nobody else on the planet has it and they're the only one does it's a ghost species because they haven't found it genetically in anybody or any hominid that they've even been able to check at this point and get any DNA out of. Once they finally do, it's probably going to be something in that Ergaster Homo erectus form species that still were on here, and that's the skeleton that's being shown there. So whenever they refer to out of Africa, they never referred to out of sub-Saharan Africa that this happened. That there were different forms, and at one point there were a lot more different forms than there even are now in Africa. So that concept always showed them, hey, that there's a lot of different hominid type species in Africa versus outside of Africa. That must have been how it happened. Well, it looks like now that that creature that we all came from that was like a shrew that ended up growing into something that was the primordial thing that's not a chimpanzee and it's not a human that chimpanzees eventually evolved into and humans evolved out on a different tree wasn't in Africa. But it evolved outside of Africa and, and then came into Africa and then that happened. So in reality, we would have to say out of Africa. Well, they found out that shrew goes all the way back to another creature, and then, lo and behold, it becomes an aquatic thing, and then it becomes a slug. So we all came from a slug. Where was this slug at? Well, it was a, kind of all around in the different oceans around in places and stuff. So A, it's aquatic, and B, it's, uh, it's uh, not from Africa. It's from all kinds of other places, but now we're at the point of Pangaea. So where did it come from? It came from Pangaea. When everything was semi-stuck together, like Africa fits on South America and so on like that, if you want to go with a timeline. So that's what it is. You can look up Astler Man and figure it out for yourself here and see what it says. And they try to be real ambiguous here because it used to say something that was a little more revealing and somebody didn't like it. But it still says the same thing, but it says it all in like lawyers speak a little bit and then they act a little ambiguous and just go with it. And they try to act like Iwo Liro is the same holotype as Astler Man, but it's not. 
just as shown by Chris Stringer, Uraliru still looks like this in Garobo, which is again over 140,000 years ago. Well, 140,000 years ago is when we are also saying that these Homo sapiens would have looked like Caucasians or Caucasoids today that you wouldn't recognize as being something different. Sure, it may be 135,000 years or more, and for positive, it's at least 50,000 years old, and those are derived natural hominids and not a hybrid from a still extant hominid that was still going on, which is even more primordial than we realized up until a modern time, and they started checking these out again. Like I said, they went through, well, what do all you got here, and what do you got there, and where did this all happen from? But you don't hear about any of this. There's an eerie silence. Because science can't do their job in this field here without having the world freak out. Nobody can look at things, or a large portion of the population can't look at things from a third person's point of view. And or they really don't want to accept the reality of that. Whether they still want to believe in a biblical model that no longer exists, people, or, and it never did, by the way, it was just interpretations from a pretty much primitive people as we look back onto it. Well, are we talking about the same thing here? No, one was at that point the most advanced people on the planet and so much more advanced than people that were still a Homo erectus form on the planet that later were hybrided into it. Let's look at something else here. Here's an article that, that came out that you'll never find in a decent science digest or anything. Uh, you might find him more in somebody's checkoff list on a cancel culture because he came out and said something like this. Africans, he's talking about Sub-Saharans, he's not talking about primordial North Africans or Egyptian people, have more archaic ape-like gene variants, says controversial geneticist Dr. Xu Huang. Well, that, that could be taken out of context, and oh my gosh, if they could just attack the concept of it. But he's a guy that, if you'll look here and pause it and just read for yourself, has all these credentials and stuff that came out. But what he's referring to is the fact that hominids are more ape-like than modern humans. We understand this. It's been something we all understand. And hominids are less evolved, less advanced, and more ape-like. The one thing that you can see in facial structure easily is the idea of a prognathism, where your mouth sticks out a little more like a snout rather than being flat-faced and or even having a chin. First people that really had a chin on the planet are Cro-Magnon types, but then again, there's that argument whether that comes in at 130,000 years or at 5060. Meanwhile, people without a chin, and had never experienced people with a chin, and has not been involved apparently with any of the evolution that was going on outside of Africa, had intergressions with animals that still lived, are people, type, holotype, hominids, if you will, of people that are living in Africa that no longer exist now because they've been hybrided into a different situation. And at least one of those is 18% unknown hominid ghost species that no one else on the planet has. Here's a weird question for you. Back to the very start of this, when we're all like a banana and we're all 1% different with a chimpanzee showing you that that was a lie whenever it was tried to give to you and try to force on you the idea that we came from monkeys is the idea that if they have 18% that no one else has on the planet but we're only 1% different, different than a chimpanzee are we closer to a chimpanzee than we are to sub-Saharan Africans? Oh my God, what are you trying to say here? What, what, what is the difference? 18% that no one has, that's the same thing. But let's go even farther with this stupidity here. We're 92% the same as a banana. 
Well, are we closer to a banana than we are to Sub-Saharan Africans? What kind of bullshit are these scientists trying to pull the wool over the eyes that they already know the answer to, but then they've already made statements, and they're sticking to these elder statements which have been blown out of the water long ago, but they keep saying it. Like they keep telling you that a woman grew from a magic rib and then ate from a magic tree because a talking snake told her to, and you're like, great, what else? He just made other statements that Sub-Saharan Africans carry more alleles or ancestral alleles or archaic types, which would be more ape type or ape forms as the definition of hominid has been well demonstrated by the rooting of phylogenetic trees in Africa, both for autosomes and uniparental DNAs by causing the outgroup rooting method. Biological significance of this? Well, there's an eerie silence. Some people have said, well, maybe this unknown head mixture is homo nalide. Is that what's present in sub-Saharan Africans that no one else has? And is it an integration that they had whenever they were still a hominid homo erectus species from Nalidae? Strange thing here is that both of these are a form, but then they would make a hybrid another form. This seemed to happen to a lot of people out of Africa with Denisovans and other things that didn't happen to Sub-Saharan Africans, but they appeared to have their own tryst going on. But instead of Homo sapien species, they were actually not a Homo sapien species, and they were Homo erectus forms breeding together to make something different. And then that was hybrid with a modern form, giving the modern form that we have today somewhere at are just near to 4400 BC near Asilar man. Here's where they find that University of California in 2019 they found up to 19% archaic hominid DNA in modern Africans. This is Sub-Saharans. These are the Bantu people actually that they don't find in other ones that are there too showing that there's a radical difference between them long time ago they did D simple DNA tests and found they were totally different. There's also a MUC7 gene in their saliva that's totally different than anybody else on the planet. Showing you that what makes them up is not the derived form that ended up even coming out of Africa and making everyone else. So this Unitarian idea they give, they have to step back to 7.2 million years ago to find a connection. We're all the same, but at 7.2 million years ago, we're all the shrew. Ape-like shrew kind of thing. So, there's not much reality in that. That's like them saying a hippo and a whale are the same thing, and then turning around and trying to tell you they're all the same. So, flawed assumptions that are going on here, just like they can tell you that another article they showed here is that uh, this uh, actor here, Ron Perlman, you probably remember him from Beauty and the Beast and how he has a more Cro-Magnon effect or a big eyebrow effect, which they say he's more Neanderthal-like. And they took that as an insult. But he has something there. But does he have a Neanderthal brain or anything about him? No, 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 no. He apparently is super advanced. How in the advanced were Neanderthals in the first place. Hey, on the right, there's this play where they're talking about how there was an Australopithecus species, perhaps making a hominid in Africa with already modern human Homo sapiens, and it's going to be a play. Wait, it's coming back is the thing if you click on it here, and they're actually going to reopen the play that's going on. Well, hold on. That was just before a few years ago. And there's a big problem there. There's another big problem, too. There's a guy that was actually a professor of a college that had good tenure and everything going on, and he came out with something that described what I just said there, too. And that was just fine. But a white supremacy group grabbed a hold of it and turned around and said the same thing. And 
Then they tracked it back to that man and they tried to get him kicked out of a college and they did. All because he was showing something that really wasn't racist in any way. But then somebody else used that information, which is true. And lo and behold, look what this cancer culture is trying to do towards the reality. If they were doing this towards any other series of scientists, everybody would balk on the situation because it's stupid to turn around and lie about what happened. It'd be like, well, gravity doesn't exist. We can't fly, but duh. You know, uh, you know, without having planes, which, of course, Caucasians created and all that stuff out of it here. Start sounding a, like a white supremacist. I start sounding like somebody that has a regional, rational mind and isn't going to play this bullshit. Um, this is reality of the way things happened and went on. And in a modern day, people try to say it's racist if you know the truth. Isn't that disgusting? That's going to end here soon, too. All this bullshit has to go away. We're not going to turn around and make ourselves into a fairy tale again, are we? Science looks at things in an objective third world or third person point of view and they don't care what the outcome is when they put it out They let you do it, too Wouldn't it be amazing if Caucasian scientists who created all this DNA stuff information were to turn around and give the information to Orientals and say check this all out and figure whenever it all happened Oh wait that guy that we're just talking about He did he is an Oriental and he's all into this idea and also he admits if I'm not mistaken by what I've been told, that this same effect kind of went on in the Orient but ended earlier, like about that 35,000 years ago wave and developed somebody that ended up being what we know of as Orientals. Now, if you were to try to figure out why Orientals have slanted eyes, you'd be, oh, no, drive him into the ground. Well, what if it's an Oriental person? Is that going to be okay? See how sad this is that it has to go along lines like that? and can't really be the truth, and you can't look at things objectively and figure it out, and then give it to them and go, what do you think about this? I mean, it's a possibility that this form right here, maybe that new dragon man that had that eye fold, because it's really just the skin on your eye, not something that's in the cranial orbits of the eyeballs to make them have a more slanted eye appearance. Maybe they could figure that out, but they'll never figure out anything we can figure out atoms and everything about the universe and stuff and then be duh on ourselves and not even figure it out when we've got it right in front of us. And it's because some people won't like the outcome. The outcome of what? Reality? Look. Stop it. Peace.